there was a little a little emergency with her dog. So, but uh, so she will be here shortly, um, and she she served as our designer for the exhibit. And and I really want to sort of. Um, to acknowledge the, the faculty, students, alumni, and friends at Chipola College who are here today uh, and attending this lecture. We at the Institute on World War II really, as I said, hope to, that, that this collaboration will continue for years to come. I want to, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is sort of to highlight this exhibit um, that, that's going to be opening formally in about an hour. Is, is that it, it's a small portion of the over 7,000 individual collections that make up the, 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 the archival holdings of the Institute on World War II, which is part of the history department at Florida State University. Founded in 1997, the Institute promotes the study of, of World War II in the broadest possible way, and, and this exhibit is one way we do it. We do that, that we try to carry out that mission. What I wanted to, what I thought I would talk about today is, is really a question that was asked to me by someone who was considering donating her father's letters to the Institute. And, and she, I could still remember tears welling up in her eyes when she said, I, we want this collection for our, for, our, for, our, for, our, for our Institute archives because it's a really valuable set of correspondence. And, and, the, and among other things about this collection is the penmanship was impeccable. Um, so it would be easy for my students to read if they worked on a project with it. But she really turned to me and she said, why do you study World War II? Um, and, and, I, and I really, I was almost taken aback by this because she was so eager to, to have her father's letters preserved for future generations because she had no children and no really family members to give this, give this, this collection to. So she was very pleased that I wanted this collection, uh, and, and but I really was ta I was almost taken aback by the question why study World War II, and I even one could even broaden the question and say why even study history in in the first place? And I think there are really two ways, and I, I really borrow this from James Grossman of the American Historical Association. There's two things that I think the discipline of history is really good at explaining: why change happens and how it happens. Um, and that can be important in a range of things we do in life. And the other thing is it's a way to often bridge the divide, that we can often understand and even often empathize with people from different ethnic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, gender backgrounds, racial backgrounds, and, and empathize with people who are very distant from us. Um, and my work, I would say, uh, studying the Second World War has only increased my admiration and understanding and, and even empathy towards the American GI uh, and, and its commander-in-chief, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, I guess in one signifier of this admiration is my son's name, uh, Aaron Roosevelt Contenti. His middle name is intended to, to preserve the memory of, of FDR. I would say that my wife stopped me from naming my twins Franklin and Eleanor, probably very wisely. Well, and, and there is a story about my daughter's name, Stella, which I, I say for another day. But suffice to say, uh, most people under 40 have not heard Streetcar Named Desire. Um, and uh, I also should say, both, a lot, they, uh, both, my sons, both my son and daughter, since they were on spring break, were enlisted in, in putting the exhibit together. Uh, on my, my daughter on Friday and my son on Saturday. This summer, when I teach an upper-level course on U.S. history, 1920 to 1945, I will give what is often now the standard introductory lecture that I give to, to, to why it's important to study this period, even if you're not a history major. And this lecture is almost geared, that first lecture is, for the student who's going to drop the course. But I want him to come away with remembering something. And I, and I make, a, I think, a very basic point. You can't understand how modern America society works today without understanding the New Deal and the Second World War. They touch on virtually every aspect of life. Uh, the New Deal fundamentally changed the relationship of the individual uh, and the federal government. It is striking how much of the New Deal infrastructure survives, whether it is Social Security, rural electric, electric cooperatives, which I was surprised to hear Marianne does not have an electric cooperative, the Security Exchange Commission, uh, government insurance of bank deposits, the minimum wage, and subsidies for farmers. In the case of Mariana, you're all probably familiar, more, much more than I am, the New Deal left an enduring mark on the landscape with the creation of the Florida, Florida Caverns State Park uh, through the work of the CCC. In the case of the Second World War, this conflict fundamentally changed our relationship with the world. 
Um, it ended American isolationism, and we embraced internationalism through the United Nations. The war accelerated technological advances that changed everything. Imagine a global economy without radar and without the modern computer. These are both very much inventions of World War II. It also changed American communities uh, and societies. Until, for example, 1942, the income tax was a luxury tax paid only by the wealthiest of Americans. To finance the war, the average American wage earner paid income tax for the first time, and we are still paying off this war in terms of veterans' benefits, interest on the national debt, and the maintaining of veterans' cemeteries. Like the New Deal, World War II left an enduring legacy in Mariana in the form of the municipal airport that began its history as, a, as an army training field um, and then would be later reactivated during the Cold War. The GI Bill of Rights played an important role in giving birth to Chipola College and changing forever the Florida College of Women. The influx of veterans seeking, a, seeking an education under the GI Bill of Rights led to the formation, led to FCW becoming FSU. The war profoundly shaped two generations, and I'm very fortunate as a historian to have been, to been able to, be, to serve as founding director of the Rutgers Oral History Archives, and granted the opportunity to interview over 200 veterans of this conflict. Founded in 1994, this project came too late for me to interview the first greatest generation, the junior senior officers of the Second World War. But I was able to talk to the men and women who came of age in the 1920s and 1930s learned a great deal, for, deal from them. To begin with, one of the things I learned, or really became much more crystal clear, was how limited the prospects of the war for this generation when they were coming of age in the midst of the Great Depression. Most of the men and women I interviewed when I was at Rutgers were graduates of Rutgers College and Douglas College, and in many ways they were from an elite background. To go to college when only about 4% of Americans went to college was a really remarkable thing. But even for these college graduates, those who graduated in the depth of the Depression, um, opportunities were, were very limited. Also, the America these, these men and women lived in was a much less tolerant society. Both Jewish and Roman Catholics recalled discrimination they endured on account of religion. Although Rutgers was integrated, only a half, handful of black, black students were admitted in any given years, usually one minister's son a year. For many GIs who grew up in New Jersey and had attended integrated public schools, they were stunned during the war when they encountered the rigid apartheid that existed in the armed forces and in the South. World War II changed a generation by affording them great challenges and opportunities. Almost overnight, the United States went from a society that suffered staggering rates of unemployment that at one point reached 25% of the workforce to almost overnight a full employment economy. This, this full economy, full, full employment economy, where both the armed services and defense factories were desperate for workers, led to some important changes because it, it opened the door and opened up opportunities for women, African Americans, and immigrants. Speaking with the World War II generation changed my teaching philosophy dramatically. So, I, one of the things I think I'm most surprised when I contemplate what the importance of my work with World War, studying World War II, and particularly starting out doing oral histories, is how much it influenced me personally, and particularly how I think of what, what I should do in the classrooms. One of the things I would say I had not fully grasped until I started interviewing the World War II generation, and I think this sort of clicked about three months in doing these interviews, was the tremendous responsibilities thrust upon them at a very early age. In one of my first interviews, I remember Tom Kindry, a retired Hill and Knowlton executive who at age 24 was an army captain who commanded 200 men in a motor maintenance unit. I remember sitting in this interview and I was reflecting as he's talking about his responsibilities and, and duties for 200 men. I was 33 at the time and I thought to myself, I command no one. I am just a sort of a lowly assistant professor on a, on a, on a research grant uh, doing this, this, or, this oral history. And I thought, wow, 20, to be 25, 24, and commanding these many men with, with such great responsibility. Or, or the interview with an Army Air Force pilot who, by age 20, had not only tr learned how to become a military aviator, learned how to fly and fly well in combat, 
but by the age of 20 had also completed all his necessary missions to rotate home and now was back in the it was now deployed to the Midwest and and teaching other pilots how to fly and all this before he could even then vote uh, at the legal age of voting was was 21. After hearing these stories, I developed a realization I, could exp I should expect a good deal from my college students. After all, much was expected from the World War II generation. Since 1994, I've involved undergraduates into several projects designed to further our understanding of, of World War II. With proper training and a modicum of guidance, they can do great things, just as their counterparts from the World War II generation. Already, they have made some impressive contributions. And to gain some sense of their contributions, just visit the website of the Rutgers Oral History Archives. Students were my co-interviewers and transcribers. Um, or visit the website of the Institute of World, War, of, of, the, of World War II and look at some of the archival finding aids that have been created by my students. We're, we have this massive collection, and one of our goals is to sort of catalog the whole collection in an online database. So we've, we've cataloged 300 collections and about 6,700 to go. Um, so we have, we have our work cut out for us. In the case of the exhibit that you're going to view today, I challenge one of my undergraduates, Juliana Witt, to conceptualize the, the exhibit you will view. Aside from insisting we use several works that are in watercolor that I just am in love with, the San Filippo paintings, Juliana was the one who selected the items we would display uh, from our extensive holdings at the Institute. She, she conceptualized the major themes. She developed the interpretive labors, and she installed the exhibit. Now, I reviewed everything, but, it was, but I was over, except for rewriting some of the conceptual head notes, I was very pleased with, with everything. And I, even, and I was even struck by how concise and how well written the, the labels for the individual items were. Um, now, of course, Juliana did not undertake these tasks alone. She was assisted by a team of undergraduate assistants and interns. Um, who under the leadership of Bri Brianna McLean, who serves as my senior undergraduate assistant, lent a hand in a number, number of areas. Allison Riley, a graduate student in art history at Florida State, played a crucial role in designing the exhibit and serving as an invaluable consultant to Juliana and me. All, Allie, Allie is, des is destined to emerge a leader in the field of museum studies, taught Juliana and me a great deal about how to mount and organize an exhibit. The other thing that I learned in a visceral way from my interviews was, was the diverse experiences of Americans during the Second World War. And this, this may seem like an obvious point, but I sometimes think our image of the World War II veterans, and it is true, there were veterans who stormed ashore at D-Day, uh, or there were Rosie the Riveters who worked in, in defense factories. But in fact, their experiences are, are there, there almost is no one World War II experience. Uh, for example, most, even most GIs in the, arm, in the Army did not see combat service. Uh, in fact, only a small but very significant minority served what they would term at the tip of the spear and served in the combat arms. For those, for those who did not see frontline service, many f performed important roles that were crucial to victory. For example, could we have won the war without the men and women who served as cryptologists, who broke first the Japanese diplomatic code and later the naval code? Many who served, I would say though, many who served behind the lines recognized their good fortune, particularly if they were off officers. For those who, who did serve in the infantry, I also learned there was no such thing as a good war. GIs who saw sustained services, service in the combat arms, especially in the infantry, had a very rough time of it. Life for those on the front line was incredibly brutish. Those in the infantry often went weeks, even months, without changing their clothes or taking a shower. Many lost good friends and comrades in the most dreadful of ways. And I can still remember this, the, the, the first GI, the first person I interviewed who broke down in tears, and what I always remember about that interview, one, he was driving up from Florida, and he was driving up to, to the New England, and he had stopped over as a good alumnus to be interviewed by me. This was in the summer of 1942, and he left his wife in the car while the interview, this sort of, I, did, I think it was a four-hour interview, and I remember he was, and he was so funny. He was such a great storyteller. He was telling me funny stories, and I was laughing. And I thought, this is great. I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. And then he talked about the failed island assault that, he, that happened. He was a captain and what happened to his unit. He said, well, we, 
we didn't get good intelligence on this island. We'd send in, we send in intelligence units, uh, you know, raiders, to, ranger units to go in, and no one would come out alive. When we got in, we, the ramp came down, and we, we got off the ramp, and we didn't make it very close to the beach, so many of my men sank to the bottom, uh, much like it is depicted in the Saving Private Ryan. Um, now, this was his fault, I would also argue. You know, he, he did not check the radios to make sure they had batteries. They were told, maintain radio silence for two minutes on the beach and then, you know, call in if you need support. So he went to call in support and the radio, the, the quartermasters did not put batteries in their, in their, in their field radios. Um, he got so severely wounded, as he said, I was in a body cast for about three months and, and, I, and I, I couldn't imagine being in a body cast in the Pacific without air conditioning. Uh, for, 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 se for several weeks before you, he was transported to the United States, States to recuperate. And as he was recounting this, he just broke down in tears. And I think I had two reactions to this. One was, I realized, wow, I really also had internalized the World War II as a good war. I wasn't expecting this. And I realized, now I'm more understanding of this. I thought this is 50 years ago. I, I mean, I, I now I became very cognizant. Those who are traumatized by war, Time sometimes heals, but not all, the, not all the time. But how can, why do we, how can any war be considered good? And why do so many Americans consider the Second World War the good war? And this is even something many veterans view as the good war. Veterans of World War II view it. There's some good reasons why it's viewed as the good war. It's the good war because the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor did unite the country in an unprecedented way. Although isolationists after Pearl Harbor still expressed doubts about the struggle against Germany, these dissenting voices fell silent after the, after the clear evidence emerged in 1945 of their myriad crimes against humanity that the Nazis had committed. Time has only bolstered the view among Americans that the war against Nazi Germany was a morally necessary one. There are other reasons why World War II was the good war. In contrast to major belligerents, Allied and Axis, the United States and Canada were neither attacked by enemy bombers nor invaded by ground troops. There has existed a home front that prospered during the Second World War, even with rationing. And this is one of the most stunning statistics that has always stuck with me, and John Morton Bloom writes in V for Victory. Even with rationing, the average civilian on the home front in 1944 was consuming more goods and services than he was consuming in 1940. When you think of that as a, you know, why would you consider this a good war? If you were, if you were on the home front, you were living a better life, even with, with rationing. And, and collectively, the bottom half of American society saw their share of the national wealth dramatically in, increase. America became economically a more equal society. Another reason why the U.S. Called it, can call it a good war is the important role played by our allies that made up the United Nations. After 19, June of 1941, the bulk of the German army would be mired in a long land war with the Soviet Union. In the case of the war with Asia, the bulk of the Japanese army remained deployed in China, even after the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Forty percent of the forces that landed on D-Day on June 6, 1944 came from Britain, Canada, and the other members of the United Nations coalition. The United States did suffer significant losses in the Second World War, 300, over 300,000 dead. And one should never minimize a war that led to American casualties that dwarfed those of, v of both the Korean War and the Vietnam War combined. But would the United States consider the Second World War a good war if we had experienced the, the mil some total of military and civilian deaths of over 30 million. I mean, this is the number that the Soviet Union lost in World War II. We might consider it the great patriotic war, but certainly not the good war. To read the letters, to listen to their oral histories, to view the photographs, and to look at the range of visual arts left behind, behind by the World War II generation, one will discover the global dimension of this conflict. American, American troops were deployed to six of seven continents. They fought on sea, air, and land. Some fought the enemy off the shores in Florida in 1942, battling Nazi U-boats, while others convoyed truck supplies from the Persian Gulf through Iran to, the, to our ally, the Soviet Union. Other man, others manned weather stations in, in Greenland. 
and still others garrisoned isolated, uh, isolated islands on the Pacific. Massive armadas of, of American bombers targeted Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan for destruction. GIs fought in the jungles of South, the South Pacific, the deserts of the North Africa, the mounds of Italy, and the forests of the Ardennes. Except on some isolated atolls, American GIs fought on a battlefield filled with civilians. The photography, the artwork, and the artifacts in, the, in, the, in our exhibit offer some, some inklings of these interactions with civilians from, 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 from other, from other con countries. We are fortunate that, many G, that countless GIs sought to make sense of their experiences through letters and diaries. Encouraged to write letters by the militaries, many GIs offered fleeting glimpses of the real war, but they're fleeting. And one could say the real war doesn't often get into their letters. Why is this the case? Censorship played an important role. Uh, and here I want to speak about Wayne Colony. Now, I, I can, the, late, the late Wayne Colony was very generous in giving us an endowment for the, for, for the, for the institute to help promote, it, promote our mission. And, and the, 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 the Colony Endowment has, has underwritten the costs of this exhibit. But I want to talk about Wayne, the GI. And Wayne, I had students, my honor students, take apart his correspondence. They, they got all his correspondence from World War II, read everything, selected the most important things. And what's striking about Wayne's correspondence is you would have no idea what actually happened to him in the war. Wayne, who could laugh about it over lunch, would describe how he had two Sherman tanks shot from under him uh, during, during the, battles, uh, uh, the, late, the, the battles for Europe in late 1944 and early 1945. And I, I think I, when he said he had two Sherman tanks shot from under him and, and basically blew up, I thought, you are a very fortunate man. One Sherman tank, I can understand, two is really remar remarkable. To read his letters, you have no inkling of the dangers Wayne faced or the grim traditions he fought with. In a vehicle, as he described to some of my students, after the students had wor worked with his correspondence, after they had transcribed his letters and annotated them, found out what happened to his unit, he described how grim the conditions were in his tank and how you know, sort of ice built up in the inside. These tanks were really designed to do one thing, was destroy the enemy, and they gave no thought to such creature comforts as heating. Um, um, uh, and temperature control. Um, he described a very miserable existence. And his letters, what does his letters talk about? The weather and his, his subscription to a, to a professional magician's magazine. Um, uh, and there's another, I mean, I, I digress about magazine subscriptions. I edited a number of years ago the, the letters that General Gavin, uh, the, the, one of the, the, the premier uh, airborne leaders, uh, uh, of the American forces uh, of one of the illustrious airborne uh, divisions. And it was interesting, I was reading these in TypeScript, and reading this in an early version, and I had a bunch of editorial queries, and one thing I couldn't understand was why General Gavin would write his daughter about his subscriptions to Time Magazine and Life Magazine. Surely you could contact the mother about this. And I know they were having an iffy relationship and they later divorced. So I, I queried the, the editor of this correspondence and, and the daughter, what's this with the magazine subscriptions? And, this, and it was fascinating because despite censorship, the people found ways to get around it, or at least the ingeniouses. So whenever General Gavin talked about magazine subscriptions, that meant he was going to a new battle. And that was his tip off to his 12 year old daughter that, you know, my subscription to Time Magazine meant, meant I'm going to go into, into battle again. Um, and, I, and Wayne, when we talked to him just shortly before he passed away, was very clear. He, he wanted to tell more, but he was severely limited on what he, what he could say uh, and write home. Although I'd say Wayne's correspondence, when he could talk about what was going on, is a gold mine of information, particularly when he talks about training. Or after a war, when he talks about what about uh, the experiences with observations about French and German civilians, I would also say there's a good deal of self-censorship. Many, many, many GIs didn't want to alarm parents, spouses, siblings, or sweethearts uh, about uh, what was happening to them and the dangers they were facing, and some did not want to talk about all their actions, particularly those who were adulterers. Let's let's you know the the, the GIs GI generation was not a bunch of saints, all of them. Um, f what, what I think it's interesting about when you contemplate the arts, for example, photography often gave GIs greater opportunities to express themselves. Scores of GIs carried cameras into battle where they, do where they documented a full range of experiences. 
Many of these photographs ended up in scrap show, sh scrapbooks shown to family and friends. Other images were placed in boxes and stored away in closets and attics. The Institute in, in World War II is fortunate to have tens of thousands of these photo photographs that document virtually every aspect of the military life of the American GI in all the branches of the service, Army, Navy, uh, Air Force, Army, Air Force, Marines, um, and Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine. These images that these GIs took are especially important because they offer a visual record of the war that often stands in contrast to the censored images that, Ameri that the American public saw in the pages of Life magazine or in their, or in their daily newspaper when the war was, was going on. Although the, Amer although the Army allowed thousands of photographs to be published in America's newspapers and magazines, they only allowed a sanitized view of the war to circulate. And so this makes these GI snapshots particularly valuable for giving us a, a more complete and accurate view of the, of the war. Photographs are clearly an invaluable historical source, but they have limits in conveying the full nature of warfare. There were very good reasons why the Army and other branches of the armed forces decided to task some GIs to become official combat artists. When you see the, 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 the watercolors of Peter Sanfilippo in our exhibit, it will suggest what the visual arts can offer. The camera was not only was not always present to record the, some of the actions that is that some of the scenes and, and, and events that are depicted in San Filippo's works. Uh, most notably, his, his, his images of, of combat and of loss. Charlotte Mansfield, a member of the Woman Army Corps, took hundreds of pictures when she was off duty documenting the experience of her fellow women soldiers. But it's interesting, Mansfield resorted to, ske to sketches to portray some of her experiences, such as a scene that you'll see in the, in the exhibit. She has a, a, a wonderful sketch depicting a group of of, of, of French children gather around a soldier. And unfortunately, her correspondence doesn't indicate the significance of these children, uh, though no doubt they were hungry, and, the, and, and I think uh, American GIs often were very kind-hearted to children. Her, you know, her sketch portrays, a des I think, a des the desperate lot of many children caught up in the midst of a total war that had, be that had eroded the boundaries, shielding civilians from the, from the brunt of war. Roland Falcon, a young girl when the Germans occupied her French village, used artwork to remember the trauma of World War II, most notably the, deport the deportation of French Jews from her town to Nazi death camps. And, and there are two wonderful paintings she did many years after the war where she was in very clearly get, coming to grips with her war and her experience. World War II was a grim, was a grim affair. And in the end, there is little good about a war that, com that, that, that is estimated to kill, have killed 100 million soldiers and civilians around the world. Some of the figures are really staggering. For instance, the United States Army Air Force and the Royal Air Force did not seek to kill civilians of occupied Europe. Um, after all, these were, these, were, these were people conquered by the Nazis. But in the end, approximately 50,000 French, Dutch, Belgian, and other occupied peoples died in air raids aimed at hindering the German war effort. In considering the destruction wrought by the bombers, it is striking how the aviators made use of nose art to humanize their aircraft and to shape a collective identity for the crews that flew them. The bombers delivered great devastation on the enemy and often sadly on, on, on you know, a collateral damage even on, on the citizens of occupied Europe. But the nose art belies another reality that American, American aviators earned every dollar of their flight pay. I mean, one of the things I learned when I did oral histories is, if I ever, every time I interviewed an aviator, even before they, they were entered combat, they would speak of someone dying in training. I mean, it was just, it, I, I don't think I did a single interview with an aviator uh, who didn't talk about death even before they got into combat. And they, they talked about how death would come to people well, there was the, they, we, we went on a night training mission and some of the planes flew into the side of a mountain. Oh, I was, I was in, in, in this base in New Mexico and this plane came in for a landing and inexplicably it just blew up as it was coming in for a landing. Uh, it was just, or you know, one, one individual said one of the first things he did when he was learning how to become a naval aviator, they had to search for bodies for a crash that had taken base on, on, on this naval, naval base. 
and the casualty rates for, for the bombers in, in the 8th Air Force, uh, the heavy bombers that bombed Germany um, and occupied France and occupied Europe, suffered staggering casualties. Most, most aviators in 1942 and 43 statistically knew they were not going to live to go home, that they were not going to get the necessary number of missions before they finally got home. So nose art should be, it's a, you know, nose art is just fascinating to look at and to think about what it really means uh, 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 for, for, the, for the aviators who, who, who drew that. As Americans, we owe a great debt to the GIs and essential war workers who made victory possible. In seeking to understand and remember their war, we should remember also that they, they sought outlets for fun, and we should not take too somber a view of the war. Remember, there was another side to them. One of the hallmarks of the American war effort would be the establishment of the U U United Service Organization, the USO by a coalition of faith-based organizations that includes the Jewish Welfare Board, the Salvation Army, the National Catholic Welfare Council, the YMCA, and the YWCA. The USO in World War II provided clubhouses for GIs around the world, around the country, where they could relax in a home-like like setting. USOs were noted for sponsoring dances and other social events. Camp Shows Incorporated, which was affiliated with the USO, send American performers around the world to entertain the troops. GIs embraced opportunities to be entertained, listen to music, and to dance. One of the great discoveries my students have in reading the letters of GIs and viewing their photographs is the degree to which these young men and women sought to have fun. They were very much like themselves in a lot of ways. The American GIs were not a somber lot, and frankly, their, their exuberance drove our British allies a bit crazy who complained that the American station in Britain were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Um, despite all we, have, we know about World War II, there is a surprising amount we do not know. Um, for instance, I'm at work at a book examining the religious life of the American GI, that, it's, that until recently a subject that has attracted little attention, and I'm, that's all I'm going to say about my work, otherwise we'd have another 45-minute lecture about religion in the American GI. Um, um, but there are, I would say there are atheists in foxholes. Not a lot of them, but there are some. Um, um, Ali, Ali Riley, who's working, and Ali was able to make it, uh, who was our designer, is, working, is, 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 is tracing the history of several important exhibits organized by the Museum of Fine Arts in New York City designed to, to bolster public morale during the war. One of my graduate students is writing a long overdue history of the Papua New Guinea campaign. Another one of my students is, is explaining where the Joint Chiefs of Staff came from, and it very much was a World War II project that happened to take on greater importance during the Cold War. The Institute has an outstanding collection documenting World War II. Individuals and groups from 50 states and several foreign countries have generally parted with their letters, their diaries, their photographs, their paintings, their watercolors, their maps, and their artifacts. But we have gaps that we seek to address. We have relatively little in our holdings that document the experience of African Americans. And in the coming years, we want to develop new efforts to, to secure more collections in this area. We also want to build on some of our strengths, such as our extensive holdings related to the U U.S. Merchant Marine in the war. Even more important, we, need to we, we strive to make our collect collections usable. We want scholars, students, and the general public to use them. Since becoming director in 2011, I've sought to encourage historians with increasing success to use our collections for their books. For example, last month we hosted Andrew Stewart of King's College London for a week while he did research on the land war in Europe. This, is, this exhibit is part of our efforts to increase, use our holdings to promote the study of World War II, not just among college students, but among the, but among the average citizen, American citizen. I would add there are two exhibits opening this month using the holdings of the exhibit, uh, using the holdings of the Institute. This exhibit at Chipola and another one at the Shoah Museum in Tokyo, which highlights the Oliver Austin collection, which, which is this remarkable collection taken by an American um, member of the occupation government that documents the occupation of Japan by American and other allied forces. Integrating the holdings of the Institute into the undergraduate cur curriculum is a long-term goal of mine. Students in my World War II lecture classes at FEU, FSU transcribe, annotate, and digitize two letters, letters from our holdings uh, in, in, into, a, into an online platform. 
students in my honors course um, who are entering first and second years students work in a group and, and what I do with the students, I break them into group and I say, here is your collection. I want you to pick the 50 most important documents. I want you to transcribe them, annotate them, write a head note introducing the collection, um, and we'll digitize that and make it a resource available to around the world. My undergraduate interns and assistants have developed fi archival finding aids, assisted in organizing scholarly conferences, written first drafts of grant application, maintained our social, social media presence, and curated exhibits. My hope is that this exhibit will begin a long-term partnership with Chipola College, especially in creating events drawing on Chipola's strengths in the arts. And I, I just would say is you have a remarkable arts center. Any community in America would be happy to have a, as an arts center of this, of this stature. It's really a wonderful facility, um, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the performance tonight as a personal aside. Finally, in organizing this exhibit, uh, at least I am conscious, and I think all, all, the, all those involved with the Institute are conscious of the importance of history as a way of keeping alive the memory of those men and women who fought for a just cause. When undergraduate assistants and interns read the letters uh, and, and diaries, view the photographs and catalog the artifacts from the World War II generation, they often feel a kinship to the men and women they will never have an opportunity to meet. I hope for all of those who view this exhibit organized by Julia, Juliana Witt and designed by Ali Riley, you, will, you will in a small way connect with the World War II generation. And on behalf of Mike Casper, Institute Archives, Ann Marsh, Institute Administrative Assistant, and the entire staff of the Institute on, on World War II and the Human Experience, please let me again extend my appreciation to Chipola College Center for the Arts and Chipola College for hosting our exhibit. Thank you very much.